So like any good research project, this one began at a bar in Reno, Nevada, drinking some scotch. And I thankfully kept the note in which I tacked all this down on, and I was able to take a picture of it. So uh, Dr. Wade Nichols and I were uh, contemplating a project in which we would start calves as, as feeder calves and document their composition as feeder calves and then document their composition of gain throughout their, their lifespan. And we wanted to feed them to heavier than normal weights to provide data for the future of cattle feeding. And uh, here's, my, here's my note. The heaviest animal in the project reached right at 2,100 pounds. And uh, you can kind of see a little bit of the growth curve there on that uh, lower right image. So to get started, I need to thank a whole lot of people that made this happen. And uh, Merck Animal Health was our sponsor, so I'll start with them. Dr. John Hutchison there in the, in the background, and then Wade Nichols uh, at the shoot. The, those two gentlemen were instrumental in, uh, in A, funding this, and B, being by my side, making it happen uh, from day one. So whenever you start a project like this, you need cattle. So I reached out to my uh, good friends at Simplot, and I said, hey, uh, do you happen to have any cattle that would fit the bill on this? And uh, of course, they said yes. And we have two Simplot representatives in the, in the crowd today. And, uh, and they were very instrumental in providing the, the right cattle for this project. So we chose uh, some, some Smokies, Charlotte Angus Cross cattle. Uh, we shipped them 23 hours from uh, Grandview, Idaho to Canyon, Texas. And uh, I'll tell you, we weaned them on the truck, literally, and then uh, put them on feed into uh, grow safe nodes in Canyon. And you can see they didn't all make it. Uh, we did lose two uh, in, in the project. And uh, this image here is Dr. David Bechtel. Many of you might know uh, Dr. Bechtel, uh, a world famous veterinarian, particularly in uh, feedlot health. And uh, we all learned how to post uh, dead uh, that, that cold uh, morning in March. Uh, it, it takes a few good ultrasounders to, to get this to work. And uh, I went through three in this project. Uh, some, I don't know that I found a good one. That's a good point. It's three mediocre ultrasounders. How about that? So uh, Flavio Rivero on the left, that's, uh, that's where we started. And uh, Flavio took a role outside the, the university system. And Dr. Perkins just happened to be coming on to the program. And so I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to call him and say, hey, one out, one in, can you, can you make this work? And he was uh, gracious enough to do that. And then uh, many of you might know Dr. Max Garrison in the, in the top right. We're doing a little old school uh, A-mode ultrasound for, uh, for rump fat depth there in that image. Uh, so as you might imagine, when you grow cattle to a ton, you run out of shoot space. And, and we indeed did run out of shoot space. We, in fact, ran out of alley space. You get to the point where the, the, the alley that was made in 1980 for feeder calves doesn't work in the year 2020 for uh, some cattle that weigh a ton. So we had to reconfigure some things, uh, do, get a cutting torch out and get a welder out and build some things that didn't exist. And I uh, needed a bigger chute. And we called up our friends at Cactus Feeders, and they said, hey, we've got one of these sitting over here. Come get it. You can have it. And so we did, and uh, that, uh, that Daniel shoot there worked well for cattle that weighed uh, over a ton. And I, I can tell you that uh, my graduate students' data sheets are very real, very, very, very real, to the, to the point of almost hard to, hard to read and interpret because there's uh, so much blood and purge and, uh, and funk on those data sheets. So as they collect the data, you can see that uh, the data are covered in blood uh, there in the meat lab. And so uh, the, the last slide here is just to recognize all of the students and, and faculty and hands that were involved in this project. Lots and lots and lots of folks to make something like this happen. So real quick, I'll, uh, I'll say that I had four graduate students do this. They were all master students. And I called these dissertations because it was a little more data than you would traditionally have in a thesis. And many of them would have qualified for a dissertation somewhere else. I just didn't allow that. This is your master's thesis. You can go do your dissertation elsewhere, uh, which uh, two of them are doing right now. And so in total, uh, at, at the point uh, that I'm going to show you today, this is a, a high level summary of almost 16 million cells of data. And it uh, took not quite 9,000 lines of SAS code to analyze that. And uh, we had 14 planned publications out of this, 12 of which were uh, chapters in their four master's thesis. So real briefly, we started out with 120 uh, Charlie Angus steers, literally weaned them on the truck. They weighed 551 pounds as they uh, left Grandview, Idaho, 
23 hour haul to Canyon, Texas. We, uh, we get to Canyon and uh, get them out, feed them hay and top dress that with starter ration. And we gave them 24 days to adjust to a drier uh, and a little bit different environment than the Grandview. And I say drier, Grandview is a pretty dry place, but Canyon actually is drier than Grandview. So uh, they, they came from dry to really dry. So you got 24 days to adjust to a, a finished ration and to the new environment. And then we had a treatment structure in which we were, were treating animals by giving them an implant or withholding an, an implant. So we had uh, NHTC, if, if you'll think about it in that manner, non-hormone treated cattle versus cattle that received a Revlor XS implant once or twice. And they were genetically paired with phenotype pairing. So I want you to think that we, we use genetics and weight, hip height, body depth, body width, and we, we did our best to, to assimilate animals into pairs so that they were as close to each other genetically and phenotypically as humanly possible. And then we randomly uh, allocated the, the Revelor or the non-implanted control to those pairs. Ultimately, we used 80 steers for the study, and that gave us 40 backup animals. So in case one died, that pair is gone, we'll reallocate a new pair into that because all 120 animals are on the treatment at the same time, but we did not slaughter all 120 in the meat lab. And then we had uh, eight steers per harvest date, and you see there day zero, so think the, the small feeder calf, all the way to 378 days on feet. So uh, we're cranking out uh, a little, a new project here all the way through that zero 378 transition time. So now I'm going to show data. And this is, a, again, a very high level uh, data that I want to illustrate growth, change, and uh, carcass composition, live animal composition. Realize there are oodles and oodles and oodles of data that I'm not able to show today in a, in a limited time frame. So after the uh, acclimation period, these feeder calves weighed 629 pounds when they started at day zero. And on average, taking together the, the treated and the control, they, uh, they averaged 1,763 pounds at the end after that 378-day uh, feeding period. And you can see I've got, a, I've got a regression slope for the, the control calves and a regression slope for the, the Revelor calves there. You can, you can take a picture of that if you want, or uh, I, I could provide you the slides later if, if uh, that works as well. The, the average daily gain, you'll, you'll notice, is, uh, is a downward, uh, downward trend here. It's, a, it's actually a power curve. And those days on feed periods, that's the exact average daily gain on that day. So uh, at 150 days on feed, they're gaining 368. I add 50 days to that, I lose two tenths of a pound. They're gaining 348. I add 50 more days to that, we lose another uh, 14 hundredths of a pound, and they're gaining 334 a day. Keep in mind, these guys were on feed for 378 days, and on average, they're still gaining over three pounds a day. So they're, they're still efficient, they're still gaining. In a, in a feedlot sense, they're still making money. So you could keep pouring it to them, and they're, they're adding appropriate weight in, in terms of live weight. You'll see later slides, they're adding appropriate weight in terms of carcass weight as well. And so they're still efficient, they're still making money. Another, uh, another slide here that, uh, that I think you'll find interesting is dry matter intake on the, on the y-axis over the 378 day feeding period. This is also a power curve. And you know it's, it's widely touted in animal science textbooks that a, a finishing steer should eat three pounds or three percent of his body weight per day. I, could, I see that all the time. Well, maybe. And, and that maybe is only at the beginning of the finishing period. And you'll see very quickly that the 3% becomes 2%, one and a half, and 1% down near the end. So as the animal continues to grow and grow and grow, the, the intake does not uh, maintain that 3% that uh, many of us have been taught or uh, we've read in a textbook. Gain to feet started off extremely attractive, uh, 4.8 to 1. You know, I heard in the, uh, in the lunch session, uh, the bull test comment was uh, 3 to 1. I was thinking, did we weigh all the feet on that at 3 to 1? That seems, uh, that's, that seems out there. But uh, 4.8 to 1 in, these, uh, in the initial time period, and that 
went down to almost 13 to 1 in the end. So uh, when you have a 17, 18, 2,000 pound steer, it takes a tremendous amount of energy just for the maintenance requirement. So uh, l less and less and less and less incremental nutrients are going to gain. So one of the many things that we did here is to take biometric measurements of the live animal, and then we'll ultimately talk about the carcass as well. And we use Max Garrison's uh, performance cattle company uh, measurement system for this. So I thought you'd be interested in uh, taking a look at their body length. So we, uh, we measured body length all along the feeding period at, at every increment prior to harvest. And the implanted cattle had about one and a quarter centimeter longer body length than the control cattle. And I know I'm mixing uh, units here, Noah, so please forgive me. I've got centimeters and inches. I, I think you'll find it interesting that they gain an inch in length every 23 days during, the, during this growing period. If I move to body width, uh, so think uh, over across the top of their back, the Revelor cattle, uh, they, uh, they were just about a half inch wider throughout the finishing period than the control cattle. And in general, cattle grew an inch every 74 days of width. So that, that body is getting longer and wider as you would expect. Hip height, something that's probably uh, most important to this uh, audience as well. They're gaining an inch every 51 days. And body depth, uh, a measurement that I'm, uh, I don't know that a lot of you would, would uh, accumulate, but uh, Dr. Garrison does as, uh, as part of his data collection system, at least in research, so body depth of these steers, they gained one inch every 36 days. And, uh, and there's no treatment difference here uh, between uh, the treated and the control cattle. We also did the same thing for carcass dimensions. And uh, I'm gonna let you kind of absorb that slide there just for a moment. Uh, so we put a, a background uh, on, a, on, a, on a wall and we put every steer in front of that background uh, just prior to fabrication. And so when we start, this is uh, you know, day zero here, so think feeder calf off the truck. And I want you to notice how lean the feeder calf is when you start. Extremely lean and quite short uh, compared to where we get to. And so as we add time every 42 days to 378 days on feed, the carcass gets progressively longer, progressively wider, and you'll notice progressively whiter as it accumulates fat and subcutaneous finish, we, we lose the, the lean muscle characteristics that you see, particularly in those first, uh, first two images there. So in our, uh, in our carcass uh, dimension measurements, one of the things that we measured was surface area. Every one of those green or black squares on the background represents 100 square centimeters. So we place the carcass right up against the 100 square centimeter uh, standard, and then we can outline it with a CAD board and know exactly how much they're, uh, they're growing. So the, the implanted cattle were, had, a, had a carcass area, or think an outline, 4.2% larger than the control animals. And something that I'll, I'll ask you to remember, this is kind of a cool thing here, all along the feeding period, those carcasses increased three and a quarter square inches a day three and a quarter square inches a day so that thing is getting larger and larger and larger and larger every day uh, throughout the finishing period carcass width so uh, this is very analogous to body depth and if you remember the the body depth slide the carcass width is exactly the same answer as body depth they're gaining one inch every 36 days in carcass width, which was the exact same math that we had in body depth. And the Revelor carcasses were four and a half percent wider than the control. In carcass length, we've got uh, one inch of carcass length every 15 days. The carcass is getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the floor. And I'll, I'll tell you that this very issue here is becoming an issue in my world, which is the, the slaughterhouse. Many of our slaughterhouses in this country were built in the 1950s, 1960s, and as we add six pounds to the animal year over year, that animal gets closer and closer and closer to the floor. And that is becoming an issue at many places. Uh, one of the other things that we did in this project is sample not only the, the carcass, 
but the bone, the blood, the hide, because we were trying to develop new empty body composition growth curves. So think empty body fat, empty body protein, empty body ash, empty body water, uh, those type of proximate analysis, but on the empty body. So we collected uh, exsanguination blood, and we collected a uh, 100 square centimeter of hide sample so that we would be able to reassimilate the carcass and develop its empty body composition. We also <coughs> took all of the internal body components. So think liver, heart, lungs, small and large intestine, pancreas, spleen, bladder, etc., etc., etc. We weighed those individually. The, the gastrointestinal tract was weighed full. It was completely cleaned out, re-weighed, and then after we'd collected all the weights, we drop it in a grinder, a grinder that we don't use for fresh meat products. That several customers have asked. And so we, we drop it in a grinder, grind it up several times into a, a nice consistent paste, and then we sample that to document the internal body composition. I do have a slide that uh, I thought you would find interesting. So think the visceral mass. So you, you have the thoracic contents, heart, lungs, and trachea, and then all of the abdominal contents, the stomachs, intestines, and liver, etc. And in the, the finishing animal, most people never see what drops off under the gut table. The gut table is a huge pot of fat. And because uh, the animal deposits tremendous quantities of fat in that region, more so for dairy cattle much more so for dairy cattle than for, uh, for beef type cattle. But notice that at, uh, at day zero, when we start with that feeder calf, the internal cavity is composed of over 60% water, just uh, and less than 30% uh, less than fat, just over 20% in fact. And then over time, as that animal finishes, a tremendous amount of the calories that we're pouring into that animal don't end up on the carcass, they end up in the, in the visceral fat. And uh, the fat did increase more than twofold as we fed these animals from zero to 378 days. So after, uh, after everything was uh, done on the kill floor, we take that carcass, we, we grade it, and then we completely fabricate it. We weighed all of the individual uh, subprimals, so think strip loin, tenderloin, ribeye, tri-tip, brisket, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, uh, every subprimal that a packer would normally make, we made weighed those, and then we dropped it in a grinder. So take all of that, drop it in a grinder, and now what do you have as a carcass composition? Again, we're rebuilding this animal to determine its empty body composition. And these diagrams that one of my graduate students made are extremely telling in the growth of the animal. So notice that the, the text says percentage change of primal weights from day zero to 378. And we've got some intermediate stops on the way here at 126 and 252. And so let me, let me point your, uh, your eye, if you will, to the foreshank. So the, the foreshank just gained a little bit, 63% and then 110% and 112%. And it's mostly muscle and bone. So that's, that product ends up as 90% uh, lean. And then take your focus to the other end of the animal at the round. 64% growth in the round, then 113% growth, and then 244% growth. And as you look through the, the primals there, the, the, most of the growth you're going to notice occurs in places that have a lot of fat in them. Take a look at the, at the primal flank. It grew 142% and then 286% and then almost 400% just because it's, uh, it's a very fatty primal. Now, as I switch this slide, you notice this is primal lean weights. So we've, we've just got lean tissue here, defatted lean tissue, and we've got a 58, 94, and 125% increase in the round. The shank stays almost the same at 34, 67, and 64. And you can, you can kind of peruse through there and see where the, where the big changes are. Most of that is actually in the, in the plate, in the flank, a little bit in the chuck, some in the brisket. Things like the, the rib and the loin, they don't increase as much because they're extremely lean already. Now the last version of this that I want you to kind of peruse is the change in primal fat weight. And remember that the object of cattle feeding is to finish the animal. 
And notice that we've now crossed the 1,000% threshold for several primals. In particular, look at the percent fat change in the plate and rib primal. A 1,500% increase in fat of either of those. And we're in the weeds to get past that. So that's, that's what cattle finishing does. We're adding tremendous amounts of fat to various parts of the body. And those parts aren't exactly equal. Okay? So, you know, another, another common thing that we're, we're taught in, uh, in the animal sciences is that an animal finishes from front to back and bottom to top. Well, ish, heavy on the ish. And this, this really breaks it down as to exactly where, uh, where they finish. In, in reality, it's kind of from the center out, if you want to be candid, and the center forward more so than the center backward. And so it, it's not exactly as, uh, as it might have appeared or you, or you might have been taught. We, uh, to, to rebuild this entire animal, we also sampled bones. And so uh, I had the graduate students choose two different types of bone. They always chose the femur and they always chose the scapula. And the logic was one round bone and one flat bone. And you take those and we sliced them every centimeter and the slice is our sample. So you run these bones through a bandsaw every one centimeter all the way through the, through the saw, and the, everywhere the bandsaw cut, that is now your sample. And so then we have a very nice powdered homogenized sample thanks to the bandsaw. And you'll notice one of my graduate students here, there was, uh, there was some hellacious noise coming from the bandsaw when you slice them end to end every centimeter, and people probably thought we were killing somebody down in the meat lab for the days that it took to slice those bones. So let's get into empty body composition for a moment. So empty body weight, for those of you who not, have not measured or done this, is the weight of the animal minus its digesta. So you have the hide on, the hair on, head on, feet and legs on, everything in that animal minus the contents in its gastrointestinal tract. So when you weigh everything individually, we can then piece it all right back together and say, okay, here's what the animal weighed without its digestive. And so they started off at 533 pounds, and then we're adding 2.84 pounds a day throughout the finishing period, and they ended up at an empty body weight of 1,608 pounds. So as we go from live to carcass, I want you to... Take a look at this slide and, and be ready to ask me a question later if, if you have one, because this might be the most important slide of our industry for contemporary issues today. I have on the left axis, or the Y axis here, carcass transfer. And carcass transfer is the proportion of the daily gain that is put onto the carcass. So let's say an animal is gaining four pounds a day. And early in its finishing period, 65, 66, 70% of every pound of live gain is going to the carcass. So real quick math, if I'm gaining four pounds a day and 70% of that is going to the carcass, that's 2.8 pounds of carcass gain. As we get to the end of, the, of this trial and the end of the finishing period, you'll notice that 70 becomes 75, becomes 80. We're on the verge to become 85. So as the cattle get heavier, the carcass transfer gets better. So in the end here, we're gaining four pounds a day, and we're gaining 80% of that in the carcass. So now of that four pounds, 3.2 pounds is on the carcass. The reason that's a very contemporary issue, and I want you to, to hear me say this, this slide is the sole reason that people sell carcasses. We have a big contentious issue in our, in our industry right now where a lot of politicians want to save the cattlemen and force live sales. If you are feeding cattle and you're doing the math, you don't want to do live sales. You want to sell a carcass because the math always says sell a carcass because I'm gaining more of that live weight in carcass form efficiently, cost effectively than I ever am the live animal weight. This slide here is why large corporate cattle feeders have said we want to get away from selling live animals, and this is the sole reason they want to sell carcasses. 
So we can, we can ask questions and we can have a discussion later, but I want you to take that carcass transfer slide and, and imprint it to memory. That's the reason we sell carcasses in this country. As we, as we break this down into uh, moisture, fat, protein, and, and the top is ash in the, in the gray bar, here's what happened over time. And, and those cattle finished and fat became a greater and greater and greater proportion of the animal. Protein actually stays relatively constant as a percentage throughout the process and we replace moisture with fat. So uh, moisture is decreasing throughout the finishing process. If we're selling that carcass and we're, uh, we're worried about the empty body, then we're probably also interested in their gain. So again, no, I'm switching units on you again. So I've got grams per day here. There's 454 grams in a pound if you wanted to know that, okay? They're gaining uh, just over 2,000 grams per day in the, in the early part of the finishing period, and they're gaining 1,185 grams per day of empty body weight gain at the end of the finishing period. And the uh, implanted cattle, as you might expect, were gaining more per day than the non-hormone uh, non treated cattle. Hot carcass weight gain, 1,479 grams per day in the beginning, down to 972 grams per day in the end. And again, the Revlor cattle uh, gained more per day than the control cattle, as you might expect. Then we get to empty body protein gain. All right, so we're feeding these cattle and we're thinking about finishing, but we're all the while still growing muscle and we're still gaining protein a little bit every day. So we start out in the beginning, these guys have about 45, 45 kilograms of empty body protein. And then they end up with well over 100 kilos of empty body protein. So it's not just solely fat gain, even though it is, it is mostly fat gain, they still are growing and their muscles are getting larger and we do have more protein in the end uh, finished animal. <clears throat> Many of you might want to look strictly at, at carcass grading features. So I'm going to show you all four of those uh, major outcomes uh, next. Hot carcass weight is the first one. So we start out with a carcass that is uh, less than 400 pounds. And then we end up with a carcass that's a little over 1,150 pounds in the end. And again, those equations there, the control cattle are growing in a, in a quadratic fashion. And the Revlor treated cattle are also growing in a, in a very quadratic fashion. Uh, pretty nice R squares though for uh, for just having 40 animals in each treatment. They uh, they grew in an extremely level growing manner. Fat depth, so the, our typical metric of cattle finishing. So we, we begin with just an animal that almost has no finish at all, and then we end up with an animal that has uh, over eight tenths of finish. So think about a yield grade four type animal, and we actually did have a few that reached yield grade five. Ribeye area, this is uh, ribeye area in inches, not, not in centimeters squared. Yep. yep. So uh, the control animals on the bottom in the blue line and then the uh, Revlor implanted animals on the, on the top in the purple line, they start out about a nine inch ribeye at uh, that 600 pound feeder calf and they end up with about a uh, 15 to 16 inch ribeye in the end. And they're still growing and they're not, they're not done growing at that point, but uh, you'll see that it's tapered off. That's a, a quadratic growth curve. Uh, I do, I should mention, because I have published this before, uh, I, I published this curve a little bit differently once in the Journal of Animal Science when I uh, made a statement that we should get away from the linear requirement for ribeye area in our uh, yield grade equation. Uh, that, if you've ever plotted that, it's an extremely linear uh, equation. Cattle don't grow in a linear fashion. Uh, years ago, I said cattle grow quadratically, and we've illustrated it uh, yet again. Cattle grow very quadratically, at, uh, in particular at the ribeye. At uh, kidney pelvic heart fat, uh, I do want to mention, this is actually cut out with a knife, weighed on a scale. This is not visually guesstimated uh, kidney pelvic and heart fat. So they all start at about 2% kidney pelvic and heart fat, and both of these grew in an exponential fashion, uh, whether they were control on the top or uh, implanted on the bottom, we, we see a nice uh, exponential growth curve to fat. And you'll notice that in these beef type cattle, we exceed three and uh, approach four or exceed 5% in, uh, in KPH. Uh, I will say that most estimates of KPH underestimate uh, how much fat is actually there. 
And if you're getting camera data back, it is probably just typed in at a, as a control 2.5. That's, uh, that's what most cameras are set at, which is an underestimate of the, the kidney, pelvic, and heart fat that is actually there. The other comment I will add, if you do this type of work in dairy cattle, the, the number range is somewhere in the 6 to 11 percent uh, kidney, pelvic, and heart fat uh, range, if you actually cut it out and weigh it. Because dairy, dairy cattle deposit extreme amounts of kidney fat uh, compared to beef type cattle. And then in the end here, we've got a uh, calculated yield grade. Uh, so we start out at a, at a yield grade 1 in both treatments, and we ended up at a yield grade 4 and or 5, uh, depending on treated versus controlled. So you might be wondering about marbling, and uh, how much did these cattle marble? Well, so we start out about a traces 80, so uh, not, not much marbling at all, and we're slowly growing marbling here. You'll notice that both of these are, are exponential equations, and we get up into, uh, on average, above modest, uh, modest choice or mid-choice for, for both of the treatments. The first two kill periods were both standard, and then the third and fourth kill period were, uh, were both select for, for fundamentally all of the animals. And then the fifth through tenth kill period, they're all some version of choice. <clears throat> we were also able, because we quantified empty body fat and we evaluated marbling score, to develop an association between empty body fat, percentage empty body fat, and the marbling score uh, needed to equal that empty body fat. And so if you're, if you're a nutritionist in the room, like Dr. Hales, uh, you would be f very familiar with uh, Pablo Giroy's equation that would say at 28.6% empty body fat, an animal has all the finish it needs to reach uh, low choice or small zero. Our data uh, say a little different thing. We actually would say that that's uh, small zero at 26.4% empty body fat. The primary difference between our data and Pablo's is we had the animal, we dropped it in a grinder and measured all of the proximate analysis, where in, a, in his equation, most of that was a portion of the animal, which was the, the 9, 10, 11 Hankins and Howe rib dissection, which is a relatively small portion of the entirety of the animal. And our data say that uh, at 18.4% at body fat, you're out of standard and into uh, select, and at 35% empty body fat, you're out of low choice and into mid choice. So a little different look at that same type of data. What's the empty body fat to hit an individual yield grade? Because yield is an important part of our, uh, our transaction system. So you'll notice that yield grade one is down at 8% empty body fat, and then a two jumps up to 20, a three at 27, a four at 32, and a five at 36. And that's, uh, that's an exponential increase in yield grade as the animal gets more and more and more well finished. 